Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, we have three sessions that we're going to um, have today. And the title of our first one is Love Not the World. This is a series on Christian standards. And before we uh, get into our study, we want to have a word of prayer to ask the Lord to bless our study together. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we come before your awesome throne this morning to thank you for the privilege of being your children, and especially because you give us guidance through your word. We ask that as we study this very important subject, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to guide our thoughts and to open our hearts. And we thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. The Bible has some unusually strong denunciations of the world. I want to begin by reading a couple of verses that tell us what relationship Christians should have with the world, if any at all. The first uh, text is 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 to 17. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. And I'm reading all of the verses from the New King James Version. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Very clearly, this passage tells us that we are not to love the world or the things that are in the world. The second text that I want to begin with is James chapter 4 and verse 4. James 4 and verse 4. This verse is very strong. It says the following, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So whoever is a friend of the world, according to the Bible, is an enemy of God. Now I'd like to ask the question, what comes to your mind when I mention the expression this is a worldly person. What is a worldly person according to the biblical definition? Now, if you've been a Seventh-day Adventist most of your life, probably you will think of a worldly person as one who smokes and drinks and parties and dances, and goes to the movies, plays poker, dresses in a provocative manner, listens to rock music, among other genres of music. However, the question is, is this really the biblical definition of what a worldly person is like? Biblically speaking, what does it mean to be worldly? Well, first of all, we have to look at the words that are translated world. In the New Testament, which was written in Greek, there are three words that are translated world. The first of those words is the word ion, and we're going to look at these in words individually. The second word is the word cosmos, where we get the word cosmology from. And the third word is the word oikumene, uh, where we get the word ecumenism from. Oikos means house, and mene means to dwell. So the word ecumenism means to dwell in the same house. And of course, that's what Christians want today. They all want to come into the same house. So these three words are the words that are translated in the New Testament with the word world in English. Now, let's take a look at the first word that is translated world. It's the Greek word ion. This word is frequently translated world in the New King James Version. It is also translated age. 
And so it's somewhat confusing as to what this word really means. Does it mean world or does it mean age? The fact is that the word ion refers to the world in its temporal aspect. In other words, within the framework of time. Now, in the Bible, the word ion refers to three different periods. The first period is the past ages of eternity before sin came into the world. That's the past age. It is also used to describe the present evil stage, the stage, the temporal stage of the world from the time that sin entered until the time that sin is eradicated. And then there's a third stage that, is, uh, used, that this word is used for, and that is the age to come. And that refers to the period after sin is eradicated from the universe. And so basically the word ion, which is translated sometimes age and is translated sometimes world, refers to three ages. Ages past, before sin, the present evil age during which sin exists, and the age to come, which is the period in the future after sin is eradicated. So let's take a look at several biblical examples of this word that is translated sometimes age because it's dealing with the world not as a substance, not the material composition of the world. It's referring to the world uh, that exists now within this period of time. In other words, it describes the world within a period of time. Now, uh, let's notice, first of all, that this age that we live in has a leader. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 3 to 5. The Bible speaks negatively of the world as it exists in its present stage. And this present stage has a God who is leading the world during this sinful period. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 3 to 5 tells us, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. So notice that there is a God of this age or of this sinful period of history. So once again, verse 4, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So you notice that this present evil age, this Ion, if you please, this period of the history of the world has a God that controls it. And of course we know who that is. That is Satan. Now let's notice some other texts that use this word Ion so we can catch the glimpse of, of what this word means. Once again, it means the world in its temporal aspect. In other words, the period from when sin comes in to where sin ends. Let's go to Luke chapter 18, verses 29 and 30. Here it's saying that an individual sometimes has to forsake everything, including family, in order to be a member of the kingdom of God. Here, uh, Jesus is speaking, so he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time, that's this period of sinful existence, and in the age to come eternal life. The word age there is the word ion. It could be translated and in the world to come, eternal life. But this is referring to the world within its period of sinful existence. Let's notice Luke chapter 16 and verse 8. Luke 16 and verse 8. Here Jesus is contrasting the sons of light with the children of this age. And we're going to study this verse in our presentation this evening. It says there in Luke 16, verse 8. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world, 
And that's the word I own, but it's translated world this time in the New King James. The sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. So notice that the, the word world here is I own. The, the people who make this world their center uh, are more shrewd than the sons of light, that is, those individuals who are expecting the kingdom to come. And we'll study this verse more fully in our presentation this evening. Let's notice Matthew 13, verses 37 to 39. Matthew 13, 37 to 39. Here it's speaking about the final harvest of the righteous and the wicked. It's the parable of the wheat and the tares. And notice what Jesus had to say. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. And then comes the key portion. The harvest is when? The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. What does that expression, end of the age, mean? Some uh, Bible versions translate the end of the world. It's the end of the world in its temporal sense. The end of this sinful period of the existence of the world. Let's notice Luke chapter 20, verses 34 and 35. Luke 20, 34 and 35. Here Jesus is contrasting those who live in this age and those who will resurrect and live in the age to come. It says there in verse 34, Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. So you know that people get married during this sinful period, right? Then Jesus continues, But those who are counted worthy to attain that age, once again, it's the same word I own that is translated frequently world, that's the future stage after sin is eradicated. So, but those who are accounted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So do you notice the contrast between this age and that age? In this age, people get married. In the age to come, that is, if after sin is eradicated, there will be no marriage. So once again, age is past before sin. The present age of the, uh, of the world is the period of sinful existence. The future age is the kingdom to come. Let's go to Mark chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. We're still pursuing the meaning of the word ion, which is, which is translated sometimes world and sometimes it is translated age. But technically it means this world in this period of sinful existence. Mark 4, 18 and 19. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. This is the parable of the sower. Some of the seeds fell among thorns. What does that mean? They are the ones who hear the word. In other words, the word is preached and they hear it. And the cares of this world, the word world there, is the word I own. It's not translated age here, it's translated world. But we need to understand that the word world that is used here is the world in the sense of this period of sinful existence. So it says, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things, entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. So notice, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things, they enter, they choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful because people are focused on this age rather than being focused on the future age. Notice 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. I'm giving you lots of verses so that you can understand the meaning of this word, I own. Here the Apostle Paul is talking about an individual who was his friend and supporter, but then apostatized. His name was Demas. And it says there in 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, here Paul is writing, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this 
present world, once again, it's the word age, this present period of existence, and has departed for Thessalonica. So notice that he apostatized because his life was for this period of human history. He wasn't thinking about the future world. Notice Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 verse 2, we'll come back to this in our next presentation. And do not be conformed to this world. Once again, the word I own. Don't be conformed to this present evil period of history, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Don't take the mold of the world, is, this, is what this is saying, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, tells us that this present age, this present period of the world, is an evil period. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3 reads, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, now notice why he gave himself for us, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. The word age is I own. It could be translated from this evil world, from this evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Bible also speaks of this present age as an age of darkness, in contrast to the age of light that is coming in the future. Ephesians 6, uh, verses 12 and 13 read, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. Notice that this is an age of darkness. This is a present evil age. This segment of uh, history. You know, you have these three stages. The past stage, before sin, the present evil stage, the age of darkness, while sin exists in this world, and then the future age where sin is eradicated. So once again, it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So notice that this present evil age is controlled by powers of wickedness in heavenly places, which would mean, obviously, Satan and his angels. Now, I want to read one more verse. There are many more that use this word, I own the world in the sense of its temporal period, uh, and that's Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. Uh, you know, this is the great commission that Jesus gave. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded to you. And here comes the key portion. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. You know, some versions translate even unto the end of the world. But really what it is saying is, even unto the end of the sinful period of this world. In other words, it's the world in its temporal sense. Are you following me? Now, there's a second world, word that is used for world in the New Testament. It's the word cosmos or cosmos, which would be the pronunciation in Greek. Now, this word refers to the world in the sense of its material composition and the population that lives in the world. So it's not temporal, it deals with the material composition of the world and with the people who live in the world, which are also, by the way, composed of matter. Uh, what does this word, world, cosmos, mean? Well, in the New Testament, it describes an all-embracing system which is alienated from God and is at enmity with God, and it embraces all spheres of human life. Now, we don't have time to read all of the verses, but I'm going to just mention them to you. In James 4, verse 4, and 1 John chapter 2, and verses 15 to 17, we are told not to love the cosmos, not to love the world. It means that we're not supposed to love the things, the material things of the world, 
or the lifestyle of the world, everything relating to the world in its present evil existence. Also, 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, tells us that we are not to love the world. In John chapter 1 and verse 10, we are told that the world did not know Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that the world did not see Jesus or hear about Jesus. In the Bible, the word know means to accept and have a relationship with. For example, in the Old Testament, there's a verse that says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Well, you know, they had lots of knowledge. They had the law, they had the covenants, and so on. What didn't they have? They did not know God personally. And so in John chapter 1 and verse 10, when it says that the world, as we know it, did not know Jesus, it means that the world rejected Christ and did not want a relationship with Christ. In Matthew 16 and verse 26, Matthew 16 verse 26 we find that Jesus uh, stated some words that we're very well acquainted with. He said, what is it worth to gain the whole world and to lose what? And to lose our own soul. He's speaking about the things of the world, the matter of the world, the money of the world, the entertainment of the world, everything that has to do with the world, everything that attaches us here. He says, what good is it for us to gain the whole world and to lose our soul? I mean, let's face it. What use is it to live in this world for 60, 70, 80, 90, or perhaps 100 years and to lose out on the age to come, to lose out eternity? I mean, that would be a terrible trade-off. So Jesus is saying, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and everything in the world? if he loses his own soul. Matthew chapter 4 verse 8 uses the word cosmos. When Satan took Jesus up to a high mountain and he showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Probably what Satan did was show Jesus all of the palaces of the kings of the world. The tinsel and glitter and money and luxury of all of these of all of these kingdoms of the world. But the Bible tells us that Jesus rejected the offer of Satan. In fact, Ellen White says that he refused even to look. He turned away and he did not continue looking. Jesus said, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? In another text, John 14 and verse 27, John 14 and verse 27, Jesus said, that the peace that he gives is different than the peace that the world gives. What is the, the worldly concept of peace? Well, it's signing a peace treaty with, with Kim, uh, the, the, you know, the leader of North Korea. In other words, it's signing treaties so that you don't have wars. That's peace. But you know, there can be peace outside and war inside. You know, recently, Anthony Bourdain, you, you've heard of him, right? The great chef, committed suicide. This man had everything that a person could desire. You know, he had money, he traveled, he had fame, and so on. But evidently, he didn't have peace in his heart. He had nothing really to live for, except for this present existence. And even then, he did not consider it worthwhile living. So the peace that the world gives is a different kind of peace. It's an external peace. It reminds me of the story of Jesus when he had the disciples in the boat and this terrible storm broke. Were the disciples at peace? Are you kidding? The external circumstances took away their peace. And of course they cried out to Jesus. They said, save us for we perish. They didn't say, you save yourself or you perish. They were concerned about themselves. Save us for we will perish. See, when there was turmoil outside, there was a lack of peace inside. And Ellen White tells us that Jesus stood up and he was in perfect peace. Nothing outside rattled him. Everything outside had no peace. But now Jesus stands and he rebukes the winds and the waters. And the sea becomes absolutely crystal clear and calm. 
You see, the peace that Jesus gives is a different kind of peace. There can be turmoil outside, but peace in the heart. And nothing outside can shake you if you are not of the world. In James chapter 1, verse 27, we are told that the world, the cosmos, defiles. The cosmos defiles. We also find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 29, that the wisdom of this world is foolishness. You know, you just take, for example, the theory of evolution. You know, the great scientists of the land embrace and defend the theory of evolution. But the biblical definition of them is that professing to be wise, they became fools. Because believing what God says in his word is wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. And if you don't have the Lord, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 29, the wisdom of this world is foolishness. The Bible also tells us that the world in its material composition, the cosmos, also has a supernatural spirit that controls it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, the name of that in Greek is the cosmocrator. He's the one that is in, in control of the world in its material substance and also the world in its temporal composition. And yet, in spite of the fact that the world uh, doesn't bring peace, in spite of the fact that the world offers no lasting blessing and no lasting pleasures, the Bible tells us that Jesus loved the world. For God so loved the world. You see, God loves the world. He doesn't necessarily love the things in the world. He doesn't necessarily love the composition of the world, the evil and wickedness that goes on in the world, but he loves the inhabitants of the world. Amen. Worldlings. For God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For John chapter 1 verse 29 also tells us that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So God loves the world. He does not love worldliness, but he loves the world. The third Greek word is the word oikumene. This word is the one where we get ecumenism from. Oikos is house, and mene is to dwell. So the word ecumenism means to dwell in the same house. And that's what all the churches want these days. They want to all join together and be in the same house. Now the word oikumene is translated world. It's not used real frequently in the New Testament. It's used, for example, in Matthew 24, verse 14, where it speaks about preaching the gospel to all of the world, and then the end will come. A significant use of this word, oikumene, is found in the book of Revelation, in two or three places in Revelation. And it's translated, those who dwell on the earth. In Revelation, it's a technical term. Basically, it means those who are attached or glued to this world, the earth dwellers, those who make this world their home. In other words, in the book of Revelation, there are those who are heavenly minded and there are those who are attached to this world. In Revelation, the word oikumene means the people who have made this earth their home and they're not thinking at all about their home in heaven that Jesus spoke of in John chapter 14 and verses 1 to 3 where he said what? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You see, God's people live in the world, but they are not of the world. So the question is, what is a worldly person? The Bible makes it clear that there are two kinds of people, two orientations or focuses in life. The present period of existence in this world 
and the future period of, of existence in the world to come. The present world, with its system, systems of politics, education, literature, art, law, commerce, music, entertainment, medicine, science, is in alienation from God. It exists basically and operates without reference to God. It ignores God. It acts as if God does not exist. In biblical thought, to be worldly is to be earth-focused in the various spheres of life. It means to live our daily life without reference to God. It does not necessarily mean that we deny God, but rather that we ignore Him or we act as if He does not exist. It is to be secular or this-worldly. Incidentally, you know, in the, on the one dollar bill of the United States, uh, which has the great seal of the United States, you have an expression or a phrase which is novus ordo seclorum. Uh, what does that mean? It means a new world order. Now the interesting thing is that the word world is the word seclorum, where we get the word secular from. Very interesting. So a worldly person is a secular person rather than holy and otherworldly. A worldly person is a person for whom God is an addendum or an appendix. It means that spiritual life is only a small ingredient in our daily routine. It means that church is one interest among many and not necessarily the most important one. It means to live for the here and now and not for the sweet by and by. It means living as if this world were our lasting home, although we profess to be looking for the world to come. It means paying God lip service. It means having a form of godliness without the power thereof. It means making God an afterthought in life. The world, you see, is a philosophy, an outlook, a way of thinking, a mindset that leads us to live our lives in a certain way. Ellen White described very well the condition of the world when he came to this earth the first time. Christ's Object Lessons, page 366. We will come back to this statement in our presentation this evening. Listen to what worldliness was in the days of Christ. By the way, the Jews were worldly in the days of Christ. You say, no, wait a minute, they were religious. Yes, they were religious. But where was their focus? Here, in the here and now. They were linked to this world and the things of this world. Notice this significant statement. Christ's coming was at a time of intense worldliness. What does that mean? Men were subordinating the eternal to the temporal the claims of the future to the affairs of the present. They were mistaking phantoms for realities and realities for phantoms. You know what a phantom is? It's a, it's a, a ghost that has no substance. She continues, they did, not, uh, they did not by faith behold the unseen world. Satan presented before them the things of this life as all attractive and all absorbing, and they gave heed to his temptation. Are you understanding a little bit better that you can be a professed Christian and still be a worldly person, focused on this age, focused on the material things of this world? You see, not only secular people are worldly. There are many people in the church that are worldly because their focus is on the here and now and not on the sweet by and by. The Apostle Paul also understood this. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul wrote, For our light affliction, that is now in this present evil age, we are afflicted, we suffer, we have pain, and so on. He says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, you say, what, what do you mean a moment? I've been suffering for years with pain. Well, let me ask you, 
how long is your suffering in this world compared to eternity? That's what the Apostle Paul is comparing. For our light affliction, which is, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's in heaven. While we do not look at the things which are seen, that's the here and now, but at the things which are not seen, that's the world to come. For the things which are seen are temporary, that is time bound, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Apostle Paul expresses it in a different way than Ellen White, but they're on the same page. Now let me give you some examples of how a person in the church can be worldly. You say, have mercy, Pastor Boy. I'm going to wax bold, so hang on to your seats, folks. If I find the Bible and going to church boring, and yet can watch television for hours without blinking, I am worldly. If I talk on the phone with my friends for hours about money, movies, the latest CDs, new clothes, I shop for sports, job, movie stars, but cannot think of anything to say when I'm speaking to my Heavenly Father, I am worldly. If I'm so tired of work at the end of the week that I do not have the energy to come to church, I am worldly. If I would rather stay at home watching television than come to prayer meeting, I am worldly. And let me say that even, that even a boring prayer meeting is better than an exciting television program. If I have plenty of money in the bank and there are pressing financial needs in the church, I am worldly. If I can scream and holler when my preferred team scores a touchdown but cannot even whimper an amen when something is said in church about Jesus winning salvation for us, I am worldly. Amen. For those who say it is not our culture to respond in the worship service by saying amen or hallelujah, hmm, i just like to see you in a stadium. There we get really excited. We scream and holler. It's not a cultural thing. It's a thing of the heart. If you want to go home at 12 o'clock sharp on Sabbath, but think nothing about long hours playing video games and watching your favorite movies, you are worldly. If you are more concerned about external physical appearance than dressing and adorning the inward person with the character of Christ, you are worldly. If you look forward more to a vacation in Hawaii than to our coming vacation in heaven, you are worldly. Does that help to understand what it means to be worldly? So the question is, how should Christians relate to the world? How should we relate to the world? After all, we live here, don't we? Yeah. By the way, that Hawaii thing, I see that Eileen is smiling, but I did not include that for this presentation. That's been in my notes for 20 years. So, so it's uh, no reference specifically to her. You know, uh, Larry and Eileen, they love Hawaii. They would love to live in Hawaii. Um, I've been there. Um, it's a nice place. Anyway, how should we relate to the world? Folks, we are strangers and pilgrims here. Our citizenship isn't here. Notice Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, and then we'll read verses 13 through 16. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10, and 13 through 16. Speaking about Abraham. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. That's the promised land. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now notice, why was he willing to do that? For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Where was the focus of Abraham? The earthly Canaan? Oh, yeah, the land that flows with milk and honey. That's what Abraham was looking forward to. No, no, he was looking forward to the city whose builder and maker is God. He lived here, but his focus was there. Notice verses 13 through 16. Speaking about all the heroes that have previously been mentioned in the chapter, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, 
and confess that they, notice what they were, that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So we are on a pilgrimage from this world to the next. Verse 14, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. If you're a stranger and a pilgrim, what are you looking for? You're looking for a homeland, right? And so now notice what it continues saying in verse 15, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire, notice all these heroes, it wasn't the earth, you know, it wasn't Canaan, the promised land that they were looking forward to, but now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. That's where our focus should be. If our focus is in this world, we are worldly. If our focus is constantly on the world to come, then we are truly sons and daughters of the kingdom. You see, our present existence is like a tent. We are on the move. We have no permanent home. Like Abraham, we have left Babylon and are on our way to Jerusalem. And meanwhile, here we do not have a permanent home. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 express this in the following way. For our citizenship is in heaven. This is not our, this is not our home. This is not our nation. Our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. When I travel overseas, I can't wait to get home. And I, and I say that with all sincerity. You know, I travel a lot. People say, oh, it's so wonderful to travel and, and you know, uh, visit all of these interesting places. I hardly ever had time to visit any of the interesting places because I'm always busy working. So when I travel overseas, which I do frequently, I'm just longing to get home. And when I get back to the United States, I give my passport to immigration. I have a perfect right to be here because I'm a citizen of the United States. Even though I am abroad, when I'm overseas, I have another home, which I long to come to at the end of a long trip. When we went to the mission field, we went through many trials and tribulations. I can tell you some of them, like sleeping under a mosquito net for three months while our furniture arrived, in a place where you had to decide whether to sleep under the mosquito net and roast to death, or without a mosquito net and be eaten by the mosquitoes, among other things. The first nine months that my parents spent in the mission field, I don't know how they ever decided to stay in the mission field. Sometime I'll tell you the story. We always, during that time, were thinking of home, <laughs> but we stayed there to save souls. Likewise, we should be thinking about heaven. But meanwhile, we should be concerned about what? About saving souls. By the way, do you know what the word uh, church is in Greek? It's the word ekklesia. The word ekklesia comes from two Greek words, ek, which means uh, out, and klesia or kaleo, to call out. So the church is composed of the called out ones, Amen. the ones that are called out of the world. You see, we are like salt. And if salt loses its saltiness, it has no reason to exist. We are light. And if the light embraces the darkness, light has no reason to exist. Jesus came to this earth as a stranger and pilgrim. He came to influence the world without being tarnished by the world. He came to the world, entered in contact with the world, but did not participate in the sin of the world. His mind was ever with his Father in heaven, though he was working for souls here on earth. In the same way, God sends us to the world. He wants us to be in the world, but he does not want us to have the focus of the world to be of the world. Now when we are on the right track, the world will not love us 
the world will hate us. So why doesn't the world hate us at this particular point in history? Well, let's pursue this. When we relate to the world in the way that we've described, the result will be that the world is going to hate us. Are we so concerned these days about what the world thinks about us that we are not willing to present by precept and example the truth as it is in Jesus? Is our primary focus on looking good and fitting in with the world? Let's read a few texts that tell us what happens when our focus is on the other world and when we live as strangers and pilgrims here. John 15, verses 17 and 18. Here Jesus is speaking. If the world hates you, he's speaking to his disciples, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. So if we were worldly, the world would love us. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, even though they're in the world, therefore the world hates you. Notice John 17, verses 14 through 16. This theme is constantly on the lips of Jesus. I have given them your word, that is his disciples, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then Jesus says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from evil or from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. In the world but not of the world. Not focused on earth, but focused in heaven. Not focusing on the here and now, but on the sweet by and by. Let's just ask ourselves a question. How many times in the last week have we thought about heaven? Have we thought about the future life? Have we thought about being with Jesus as compared with all of the cares and duties of this present life. I leave it to each one of us to ask this question because it will show where our focus is, whether we are earthbound or whether we are heaven bound. The Apostle Paul, in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, wrote these words, Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution. That's not what it says. It says, yes, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Not might suffer, will suffer persecution. Ellen White has this significant statement, Great Controversy, page 48. You know, why isn't the church being persecuted today? You know, people say, well, because the Sunday law hasn't come yet. Well, why hasn't the Sunday law come yet? Let me read this statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. There is another more important question that should engage the, engage the attention of the churches today. This is for the church. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? The only reason So persecution slumbers for how many reasons? One reason. The only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. The religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin because the great truths of the word of God are so indifferently regarded, because there is, no, there is so little vital godliness in the church, that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. And then she states this, let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church, and the spirit of persecution will be revived, and the fires of persecution will be 
rekindled. Sobering words as to why we are nice and comfy and not suffering persecution in the present time. Folks, the present world is passing away. As 1 John 2.17 says, and it could be translated, the present world is disintegrating. It is vaporizing. It reminds me of Fresno, the fog in Fresno. You know, you get up in the morning, you can hardly see from here to the door. However, you know, a little bit later on in the morning, maybe about 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, the fog is gone. That's what the word means in 1 John. The world is vanishing away, the, just like fog. It's dissolving, it's disappearing. Now, if I, I ask you, if you knew that your bank was going to close for good in a week, would you put large of sums, sums of money in, the, in that bank? That, that's a dumb question, isn't it? Of course, of course you wouldn't. Because if the bank is going to go bankrupt, why would you invest your money there? Now let me ask you, is the world vanishing away? Is the world bankrupt? So why are we investing so much time and effort and money in this world? Should we not send our, world, our, our money to heaven beforehand? Should we not invest in heaven, as Jesus said? Lay up treasures in heaven? The Bible warns us that the world is passing away, 1 John 2.17. The present evil age will come to an end, Galatians 1 verse 4. The temporal is worthless, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 17 and 18. Jesus warned that the cares of this life should not overwhelm us, Luke 21 verse 34. The Apostle Paul in Colossians, Colossians 3 verses 1 and 2 said that we should focus on the things that are above. In Matthew 16, 26, I mentioned this, Je Jesus said, what value is there to gain the whole world and to lose our own souls. You see, we live out our deepest beliefs. The world is a mindset, an outlook, a way of thinking, which leads to a particular lifestyle. The problem is not with our behavior, because the behavior is only a symptom. The problem is with the way we think. The problem is with our mind. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world. The word conformed means do not take the mold of this world. Do not fit within the mold of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of what? Of your mind. So in other words, it's our mind that needs to be changed, and then our priorities will change. Our focus will change. Our conduct will change. If the mind has changed, we must have the mind of Christ. The book Evangelism, page 272, Ellen White wrote, there is no need to make the dress question the main point of your religion. She does have a lot to say about modest dress, but she says don't make it the main point. Why not? She says there is something richer to speak of. Talk of Christ. And when the heart is converted, everything that is out of harmony with the word of God will drop off. It is only labor in vain to pick leaves off a living tree. <laughs> now, people think that they, they need to pick this bad habit off, and they pick this bad habit off, and they pick this bad habit off, but the problem is with the heart. So you can pick the leaves off, it's not going to do any good to convert the tree. So she says it is only labor in vain to pick leaves off a living tree. The leaves will reappear. The axe must be laid at the root of the tree, and then the leaves will fall off, never to return. That is, if it's a bad tree. Colossians 3, verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things on earth. In Titus chapter 2, verses 15, 11 to 15, the Apostle Paul admon admonished those who are waiting for the second coming with the following words. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The churches say, oh, it's all about grace, grace. Your behavior doesn't matter. Your conduct doesn't matter. You know, you're saved by grace through faith. And, uh, you know, your works don't count for anything. But notice here it says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us. The grace of God teaches us something. What does it teach? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, 
righteously and godly in the present age. Why? Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, notice why, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass, pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with her fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So this world and everything in it is going to be burnt up, folks. Everything we have. And wh So what is the consequence? Notice verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. I conclude by mentioning briefly the experience of Enoch. Enoch lived in this world, but his mind became so identified with God that even though he lived in this world, he witnessed to this world. Ellen White says that when he was gone, he was missed by that sinful world. Even though he lived here and he witnessed for God here, his mind was so much in heaven that the day came in which Jesus said to Enoch, Enoch, there's nothing to attach you to that earth down there. There's nothing. You have no link to the world anymore. Come up here and we'll walk along the street of gold throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Enoch had the correct focus. He did not focus on the here and now. He focused on the sweet by and by. And the Bible says that God took him to heaven without seeing death to walk with him in the holy city forevermore. The first person to be translated from the earth to heaven from among the living. He's a symbol of 144,000 whose focus will be heaven and not earth. May that be our own personal experience.